And then we want to move up to um, later on uh, this great book that is very important for Orthodox theology because you might not know that the Orthodox, especially in Byzantium, uh, shut down the Platonic academies, right? Uh, Aristotle kind of became the philosopher, so to speak, of apodictic logic. Uh, pa Palamas writes the apodictic treatise on the Holy Spirit, accepting a lot of the basic principles of Aristotelian logic. That's not to say that there weren't some Neoplatonic influences on St. Maximus or on Palamas, even when it came to the Logi. But when it came to the Platonic Academy, Byzantium shut it down. However, it gets revived. And when it was shut down in Byzantium, it was actually underground for many, many years. And one of the key figures in the underground Platonic Academy was Gemistos Plethon. Plethon was interesting because he was a unique atheist Platonist. So you might think, well, wait a minute, how can you be atheist Platonist? Well, Plethon saw the ideas of Plato not as existing in a transcendent realm, but really as symbolic of this realm or patterns and structures of this realm. And so there's not a personal God, ultimately, that unifies and gives meaning to reality in Plethon's system. For Plethon, atheistic Platonism is the ultimate answer. And, I, and if I recall, I think Plethon also tried to give place to process and change. Because in Platonism, there's always a... a never-ending question about how to give an account for change, right? That's one of the reasons Aristotle disagreed with Plato. There was many others, but one reason was that uh, Aristotle didn't believe that Plato had a good account for change, right? He didn't have a good account for the relationship of the realm of the ideas to the realm of the here and the now, which is change and flux. And so this is partly what motivates Aristotle's response to both the pre-Socratics and to Plato. So in Byzantium, this figure of Plethon left scholars of Platonism puzzled as they struggled to understand the project described in his big treatise, the Nomoi. It entailed abandoning Christian orthodoxy and to revive the ancient pagan notions that were present in Plato. The only copy of this work was burned by Patriarch Gennadios Scholarios, who kept some excerpts to prove that he was justified in destroying it. After the publication, fragments survived uh, by translated by Charles Alexander in 1858. A variety of different interpretations of Plethon's Platonism have been suggested, ranging from the idea that he was the leader of a pagan cell operating in the Peloponnese, and to the idea that he was, uh, this is his secret society. A whole story of apostasy from Christian orthodoxy uh, amongst other philosophers. They argue that the background of these scholarly impact, uh, this scholarly impasse, uh, Senecio Glue's book tackles the problem of making the sense of Plethos, Plethon's pagan Platonism for the point of view of the history of ideas. It explores the intellectual history of the 14th century as the current context in which Plethos, Plethon's philosophy has been understood. As a result, what he offers is not a general introduction, but rather a historical survey of this enigmatic figure. The result is a learned and stimulating book. Okay, yeah, we got it. The book is organized into various parts. Uh, and here's the key point where it gets to the end. Now notice underground Platonism, right, as a sort of secret society throughout uh, Byzantium. I want to get you to the end because the, the ultimate thesis of the book vindicates a lot of what I've talked about and it vindicates what's in this book. And this is the idea that, uh, I don't know if this, this is just somebody's analysis of the book, but um, the Platonic atheism influences Spinoza, and that also influences the Illuminists of the time period that we're talking about, this time period. So there's a direct ideological lineage from Plethon's atheistic Platonism to Spinoza and to Weishaupt in those characters, and Sinisiaglu even says that. He says that the Illuminists of the Weishaupt era are influenced by this philosophy. So if you've not read it, I highly recommend the excellent book, the very well-documented Cambridge production, Radical Platonism in Byzantium, Utopia and Gemistos Plethon by Nikitas Sinisioglu.
So that's, you see how we're tracing this up through, and by the way, for those that don't know also, the chief philosophical ideological opposition to the church fathers throughout the first seven ecumenical councils is Greek Hellenic dialectics. Every one of the ecumenical councils is battling various dialectical argumentation. Either this or that. Either Jesus is human or he's divine. Either the Trinity is a Unitarian thing or it's tritheism. Either Jesus is, uh, his will is overtaken by the divinity or he's subsumed in the divinity. It's either or, it's dialectics constantly. Because Greek philosophy, as we saw with Heraclitus, is premised on the necessity of opposites. The necessity of opposites. Orthodox Christianity and Orthodox philosophy is premised on the rejection of metaphysical dialectical oppositions. There are oppositions in nature, sure. But it's not a necessary opposition, number one, because this world is fallen. So you would only take these things to be natural if you didn't believe in the fall. But our world is not natural. It is in a degraded or unnatural state because of the fall. Nature is still good. But as Paul says in Romans 8, it is in bondage to corruption until the eschaton. But regardless... The state that we're in now, although not inherently evil, is not itself the the ideal state. It's not the Edenic state. It's not what we have in the eschaton, right? And so all of Western philosophy is premised on dialectics. <clears throat> and this is one of the key elements that distinguishes Orthodox Christianity from all the other philosophies. And I would argue even Far Eastern philosophies. Far Eastern philosophies are also enmeshed in dialectics. Either or. All reality is one thing, or it's two things. Or it's no thing. Those are all dialectics. And whenever I talk about this, people don't know what I'm talking about. And they get confused. They, don't know what they think dialectics is the same thing as dialectical method. No, no, no. That's, dial that's pedagogy. That's teaching. Okay, that's question and answer back and forth. Nothing wrong with that. That's just classic ways to teach people. The elinctic method. I'm talking about metaphysical dialectics. That all reality is fundamentally constantly flux and struggle, strife, and emotion. Nothing is fixed. Nothing is objectively true or in permanence or in stasis other than what the party dictates, you see. So in this way, it's, it's, it's very similar to the metaphysical discussion that O'Brien says to Winston in the metaphysics debate in 1984. So he said, but wait a minute. Lenin argues for objective truth. He doesn't think that everything is flux and sophistry. Yeah, but that's just contradicting. And the question is not, does he think that or does he say that? The question is, is that consistent with the rest of what he says? No, it's not, right? So again, just like Thomists, they think that stating the position is an argument. Likewise, Marxists, let me state what uh, uh, Lenin's positions are. As if the question is, what is the position? The question is, is the position true? Is it coherent? What, are there good reasons to believe it? People don't even know the difference between stating a position and arguing for the position. What is your position versus why should we believe the position? It should be pretty obvious. It's a really basic thing, and people don't they don't know what this is. They, they're lost. So I've seen hundreds of comments over the past few days as a result of all this uh, Marxist jibber jabber, and I've not seen but maybe one or two of the entire crowd of them even understand the difference between stating a position and explaining why we should believe that position. I mean, it's like, it's, it's not, it's not hard. Yeah. Reality is reality. Exactly. Just what T-Jump said. 